diets actually are not even about economics per se. Uh, it's about that enlightenment movement that I referenced yesterday, the jigsaw. And man, I talk about this in every class just because it's so important uh, for social science. Uh, this is the movement for the first time that said uh, screw command economies and screw the feudal system or caste systems. Uh, there aren't people that are naturally superior to others. Like there's, the Enlightenment essentially broke the idea that just because you're born to a certain class means you are superior or inferior. Uh, this is the one that said, no, 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 no. We're all individuals. Maybe you are born into a high class or a low class, but you maybe don't necessarily belong there. So just because I'm born into a poor family, whether I was a peasant 500 years ago or I'm born into a lower class family now, that doesn't mean I'm stupid or lazy or something like that. I could, and this happens all the time, uh, go out, get motivated, uh, get educated, and bring myself out of poverty. Like that actually happens, part of the American dream. It's, it's possible to do that, right? The only reason that's possible is because of the enlightenment. So it starts with a guy, or one of the guys it starts with, is a guy named John Locke. And he, I mentioned this yesterday, you guys are like, what is that? He came up with a concept that we know is not entirely right, but the idea was uh, a good idea at the time. It's called the blank slate. And this is the idea, and again, this is a, he's, from the, he's in the 1600s. This is the idea that I am born as a blank slate. How is that different from how they viewed human beings before? Uh, before they viewed you as your class, but if you're viewed as a blank slate, then you could be anything. Yeah, you could be anything, exactly. So this is like, again, this isn't quite true. We definitely know that you have instincts um, from uh, previous, uh, uh, from, from your evolutionary history. Uh, we know that you're, you're born with uh, a tendency to like certain things or not like certain things. Um, what else do we know? You have a certain capacity for intelligence and ability and, uh, and like your mood, whether you're like a generally a happy person or generally a sad person or a fluctuating person. Those you kind of inherit. But certainly the idea that you shouldn't be prejudged just based on where you were born uh, is a good one. It gives you a chance to move up or down based on how motivated or smart or, or whatever you are. All right, so this was very important. It was a major shift. So it was again the belief uh, that everyone is born uh, equal, essentially, because before they believed if you were born in the, uh, the higher classes, you were naturally wiser or more gifted, all right? This rejects that idea, all right? So it's wrong in that every single person has the equal ability, but it is right that we shouldn't prejudge because we have no idea what your actual abilities are. Like you could have a wonderful set of creativity, uh, productivity, intelligence, and change the world. Like I said, like some people already mentioned, Jeff Bezos, uh, Elon Musk, et cetera. Uh, but we, we don't know that. So we have to assume that you have this, this raw potential. That's what John Locke does. So he establishes this precedent that no, 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 no. Just because you're born in the nobility or into royalty or you're a member of a guild or whatever, it doesn't mean you are superior. Anyone could potentially um, become very good at what they do or, or change the world. All right, and that's a very, very important uh, concept. All right, because from this, if I believe everybody is born equally and could be good or could be bad, should I limit you based on your birthright? No, why not? It's unfair. Okay, it is unfair, you're right, but even more than it's just unfair, why is it actually better that I don't do that for everybody? They could, yeah, okay. If I'm limiting peasants from doing anything, if I'm saying, you have no rights, you have to live on this land right here, there are some of them, and again, we already know this, some of them are actually intelligent and motivated or have something to prove, and they can actually find a better way of farming or find a better way of making better pizzas or whatever the hell it might be. Uh, and if you allow them to do that, everyone actually benefits. Because if I find a better way to farm, is it just me that benefits from that? Who else benefits? How does everybody benefit? More what? Yeah, you got more food, right? So less people starve. That's a pretty good thing, right? That's a good start. Uh, and you can't allow people to do that if you are limiting them based on their birth. So this was a, a really 
a landmark revolutionary idea because it allowed individuals uh, freedom of choice. So that allows you to go out and try something new. Is it going to fail? Probably. Sometimes it doesn't though. Sometimes you learn from your mistakes and, and turn into something better, uh, or sometimes it just works out in the end. So John Locke believed you should have the chance to fail. All right? All previous systems said, nope, don't give them the chance to fail. They're going to fail. They can't do it. John Locke says, no, no, no. You all have equal amount of potential. So we're going to give you a chance to go out, try your own thing. If it fails, it fails. But it might not fail. And if it doesn't fail, it's probably going to make the world a little bit better. Uh, and it does. This is why, for example, after these ideas kick in in the 1700s, uh, we see a ton of change in the world really quickly. Like all the scientific um, advances, the Industrial Revolution, uh, way more food being available, people figuring out how germs work, how electricity works, um, how, how power works, how machinery is made and works. All that starts because people in the West, in Europe, the United States, etc., they were allowed to go out and try to find things out and try things on their own. All right, that's, that's what's going to uh, set this whole system off. All right, so he believes that you're all born equal, but that furthermore, you shouldn't be limited, obviously. In fact, he reverses it. So it used to be the government limited you, right, based on your birthright. So if you were born as a peasant, you were limited. You couldn't go anywhere they didn't trust you. John Locke flips it. He flips it to, you're not limited. Guess what's limited now? The government's limited, all right? He flips it to not limited individuals, <coughs> but limited government. And what I mean by that is the government, there's only certain things they can tell you to do or not to do, all right? In fact, this is where we get the idea of natural rights, that if you're born as a blank slate, which is what he believed, you should have the opportunity to do whatever you wanted, right? As long as you're not like killing people and taking their stuff. Obviously, we can agree that's not something that's beneficial. Uh, but you shouldn't be limited. So you should be uh, granted at birth a set of rights uh, called natural rights. You guys know what the natural rights are? Life, life, life and property. liberty, and property. Exactly. Or pursuit of happiness. Right, that's how uh, Jefferson rewarded it. Not happiness, by the way, the pursuit of it, right? Because he realized that we cannot all gonna achieve it, but you should be able to at least try to achieve it. All right, cool. So natural rights. So uh, his idea was the government should uh, protect these, not limit these. That's the government's new role. So before it was, no, no, the government tells you what to do, what you can and can't do. Instead, though, he flips, he says, no, the government's role shouldn't be to do that. It should be able to allow you as much of this as possible. Its role is to protect that and almost nothing else, all right? So what do I mean by your right to life, obviously? You have a right to life, what does that mean? Like no one should take your life. Exactly, no one should take your life for no reason, I guess is probably a better way to put it. All right, so the government shouldn't just be able to kill you because they said you did something wrong, right? I shouldn't be able to kill you uh, without any consequence, right? Now there are situations where, um, uh, you know, you've been convicted of a crime, like say you're a murderer, for example, uh, or a, uh, a serial rapist or something like that. Those are the people that uh, the government does find guilty of crime uh, and kill. And I could potentially, or you could, kill somebody else in self-defense, uh, but you can't just roll around killing people. Uh, the government actually protects your right to life. So if somebody does go out and start murdering people, the government puts them away, essentially, so they can't do that anymore. All right, so yeah, your life should be protected. The government should not be able to take that from you. Uh, unless obviously you lose the right to that by going on murder sprees or, or whatever. Uh, what about liberty? Freedom. Uh, freedom to do whatever you please. Yeah, exactly. To do whatever you want, as long as you're not taking from other people, essentially. Right? So if I want to uh, move to another state uh, and, and do a whole different job, um, even though my parents don't want me to or, or whatever, I can do that. All right? And that, that's the idea of liberty. How do you get your liberty taken, by the way? You can get your liberty taken away. How do you get your liberty taken away? Um, if you get arrested, are you doing wrong? Yes, if you're convicted of a crime, right? That's essentially going to jail, right? So if I rob a bank and I get caught, I'm losing my liberty because I obviously can't be trusted. Uh, I've gone out and I've terrorized people or stolen or, or committed some heinous crime. 
So I end up getting put into prison, right? I lose my liberty there. Then I lose my ability to do whatever I want because I'm <clears throat> stuck in jail, essentially. All right? But here's the big one that I wanted to focus on uh, for, for these notes, was the property. Do I mean just land? Like just the land and house that I own? What, is, what does the property mean? Like, <clears throat> like your values? Okay, your values, definitely. But like, I mean, I would say your physical possessions probably is what we, what we would say, including your money. All right, so it's not just your house or just your land, but also the money you have, any cars you have, any clothes you have, or, or, or anything, your phones, that's technically uh, your property. Did this exist before John Locke uh, came up with these ideas? Did private property, the idea that you owned your stuff, did that exist before? No, it didn't. What existed before? Remind me. Common land, Common land right. You were renting anything from the uh, nobles or the king. You didn't own anything on your own. Right? So that's why there was no point to go farm better, because uh, I don't get anything anyway. But if I own the land, like I own a little plot of land, and I farm it better, and I get more food, is that going to benefit me if I own the farm? Yeah. How? Because you get all of it. You keep it, right. I could even keep the extra food and not worry about starving, or I could sell it to somebody else and get more money, buy other things, buy more land, whatever. I have an incentive now because I own the property, all right? And the government actually protects your right to have that property. People can't just roll in and take it from you. It has to be purchased. Uh, you could lose it, obviously, if you uh, go to jail and lose your liberty, things like that. But that's what prevents me from going out and stealing your car, right? I could steal your car, or you could steal mine. Um, and I could get away with it, or you could get away with it. But what's likely gonna happen if you go around stealing people's cars? Um, you're gonna get caught and put in jail, right? And then you're gonna get your stuff back or insurance companies are gonna pay you for it. So this idea of private property is actually brand new. No one had ever thought of it before. It didn't even exist. If you walked around 600 years ago and said, that's my property, they would look at you like you were crazy because no one owned anything. It was all owned by the king or the guild uh, or um, the nobility, right? But this is different. This is, oh, if I find a better way to make pizza or farm or whatever, uh, I actually get the benefit. So does that motivate me to try to figure out new ways of doing things, better ways of doing things? It totally does, because I get the actual reward, or my family gets the reward, right? It doesn't have to be completely selfish. Obviously, if you're single, it's gonna be going to you, but if you have a family, uh, whether it's your parents, your extended family, uh, your wife or husband and kids, uh, they're gonna benefit from it as well. Uh, likely your community will benefit as well. So it actually resonates outside of just you selfishly wanting things uh, too. So that's why this is such a revolutionary idea is because if you own the property, you're now motivated to uh, try new things and make things better because you actually get the rewards. It doesn't go to somebody else. So now people have an incentive to uh, go out, try different things, find better ways of doing things, make things more efficient, uh, be creative, uh, try different varieties uh, to find out what works and what doesn't work. All right, you guys with me on that? Yeah. All right, cool. So real quick before I throw that slide up there, I actually think I described a few of them. Um, what was John Locke's revolutionary idea that uh, changed how we saw the role of the government? How? Yeah, but before it was based on the class you're born in, now it's like everyone has a, a chance to. Okay, cool. So because everybody's born with the same potential, this blank slate, um, what should the new role of the government be? Before it was to limit people, but now what should it be? To protect your rights. Mm -hmm. Exactly, to protect people's rights. So instead of the government limiting people, the idea is now people limit the government, right, to just protect your rights. Cool, and what are those rights called? Natural rights, right, so we should be guaranteed natural rights. All right, um, when referring to economics, at least, which is the uh, one that we talked about most that actually encourages you to go out and try different things um, to uh, be a better farmer, uh, to be a better uh, pizza maker or whatever? Which one of my rights is highlighted that is most important? Liberty. liberty, that's true. I, I guess I guess I didn't ask a very good question there because you, you just have the right to choose it. But what actually makes me benefit from me trying to to, to try to do different things? Property. How so? Because if you 
on your own property, you can, you have, like, you can get all the ex excess food and products, and then you can sell them, and then get more land, and then get more from it. Exactly. Uh, if I do well, I benefit directly, or my family benefits, right? So I have an incentive now to go out and change things, do things better as before. I didn't, because I got nothing for it. Exactly. Cool. You guys got that. England in Europe is basically the first uh, area, state, government to uh, start adopting this policy of private property. And what we mean by private property, by the way, is yeah, the stuff you own, but the government actually protects it for you. All right? That's what a constitution is. It's like a set of rules for the government. It's stuff they can and can't do. Stuff of yours they're supposed to protect, like property, life, liberty. Um, Constitution is going to be formed first uh, in England, e going back all the way to the 1200s with the uh, with the Magna Carta. We don't need to know all that though. Just know this though: England is one of the first places in the world to uh, give you natural rights and requires the government to protect them. All right, so England is where this is really going to start taking off, and the Netherlands too. But we'll just we'll stick with England for now. So Locke's ideas influence this, and um, what happens very quickly is common land gets erased for the most part uh, because it's not a good system. So here, here's why, here's what happens. This is the enclosure movement, uh, which was on your jigsaw, I believe. So you got a lord there, rides in his manor. He's got a bunch of peasants running around, wreaking havoc, uh, farming what they can, but they're not very good at it because who taught them and who's telling them that's the best way or, or not the best way. You've got animals walking around uh, anyway, um, uh, defecating. Um, in spots that aren't optimal, walking on uh, crops, eating them. They're hunting, they're not using the land uh, appropriately. So some of these lords uh, or nobles, uh, other nobles or whoever, they start realizing that once there's private property, there's a good reason to uh, kick some of these peasants off the land. Why would I, if I was a nobleman or, or whoever, why would I, because normally if I had extra, excess grain, I'd probably give it to the king or, or, or whatever. Uh, not anymore, though. So why would I actually want to kick some of these peasants off my land? There's less mouths to feed. Okay. It's not even that there's less mouths to feed. Let's put it this way. If I said, hey, that field out there, you guys all can live on that. Use it however you want. Would you guys go out there and use it to the to its most efficient uh, uh, way, or would it would it probably not be used as best as it could if you were all just randomly out there on it? It probably would not be used uh, that well. Okay, so what they decide to do is, if I got people just randomly living on this thing, they're not gonna farm every square inch of it. They're gonna live on some of it. Um, they're going to let their animals roam around uh, and mess up the crops or, or, or whatever. They're gonna hunt. Uh, they're not gonna take care of certain portions. So what they found actually worked best was, I should find the peasants who uh, I think will do a good job in farming and kick the rest off. Because now what can I do with these uh, remaining four guys? Expand what? Expand their land to farm. Yeah, I could expand their land, right? And I could pay them for working. Because I no longer, uh, they're no longer my property anymore. They're, they're free people, essentially. They can leave if they want to. So I'm gonna pay them to do what? To work, to, work it. to work it, exactly. And, and not just like live on it and randomly do it. I'm actually going to pay them based on how good they do, on how much extra food we end up making. So they find that this is a much better system uh, for making money. And that does sound greedy, and it is. But it's actually a, a good thing in this case. So they kick off, I know, we'll just say they kick off half the peasants. They keep half, they pay them, and these peasants stay, and they farm the land as best they can. They use every square inch that they can use, and they farm it to the best of their ability. Uh, because they own it, it's not common land anymore, they can use fences. What are fences good for, for farming? Keeping animals out. Yes, keeping animals out, or the people, but yes, certainly the animals. Right, so now I don't have like random animals coming in and eating my food, stepping on it, defecating on it, whatever. Right, so I, I can preserve it, and I can also potentially keep other people out, because I actually own this property now. All right, so very quickly, after they start fencing off the land and organizing it for farming, um, all of a sudden, I get way more food because they're using the land properly, they're maximizing it, they're protecting it, uh, and they're pumping out as much food uh, as they can. Good or bad thing? Good. Definitely a good thing. Because I know we don't know what famine really is because we've never had one 
I mean, in the developed world, we just don't have fans, they don't exist. Even if we have a bad year of farming, it's like, dude, we got storehouses full of stuff that could last for like, you know, 10 years and canned food and whatnot. We're not worried about famine. Famines were real back then, though. You don't get enough rain one year, people are starving to death. All right, so food is not abundantly available. But now, after the enclosure movement begins, right, and that's again where they start fencing off land because they own it and they want to profit, make as much possible, as much as possible, we start getting more food. So that's good because we have more food available. Um, also, too, think about this. If there's a ton of food available, is it going to be more expensive or cheaper? Cheap. Why is it going to be cheaper? Yeah, there's like a bunch extra. If I'm trying to sell it to you guys and I don't even, there's not even enough of you buying it, uh, I'm going to have to reduce the price to get you to buy more. Because uh, unless you just go to somebody else or um, make your own or, or whatever. Right? So because there's more food available, uh, the price is cheaper, so more people can buy it, uh, and more people have access to that food. So it, it ends up being very, very beneficial, uh, and that's part of that enclosure movement. Uh, so, but it doesn't end there. This starts a chain reaction of events that make the whole world better, uh, at least for humans at this point. So, who's benefiting from this besides everybody who's eating? Who's benefiting the most from this? The Lord. Yeah, the people that own um, and, and run the, uh, the enclosed land, the, the farm, exactly. Cool. So I start getting more money because I've closed it off, I'm making as much as I can, I'm selling it, I'm getting more money. And then people that make money, yeah, they, they spend it. But um, do they just sit on it? They just go, ah, look at all this money I have. They like Scrooge McDuck it and put it in like a big uh, vault and swim around a bunch of gold coins all day? No. What do they do with it usually? Improve the land. Improve the land. Or? Expand it. Expand it, right. Now, I can go over to this other guy who's got some land here. Maybe he doesn't have enough people to work, maybe he doesn't know how to work it or whatever. Uh, now I offer him some money. Hey, I'll buy some of your land. Okay, so he gets some money, yay him, I get more land, and what, is, what are they gonna do with this land they just bought? Same, same exact thing. Fence it off, farm it, maybe hire some more peasants to work it. All right, so very quickly, these uh, people who are successful start expanding and becoming more successful. And like I already told you guys, it's beneficial to everybody in this case because there's more food available, so less people die of famine, and it's also cheaper, uh, so you can buy more of it. And this is a system that keeps on growing and growing and growing and growing and growing uh, and making things a lot better. This is why I think I showed, I think it, there's a graph in there uh, from last week, uh, or, or maybe it's in this one, I don't know. The population of the world from year zero to you know, 2020 right now, up until about the 1600s, it like barely went up. It would, it would go like this. I don't even know if I'm actually raising it. There we go. It's just barely going up at all. In fact, when we had the plague too, it actually dipped for a little bit. And then starting about the 1600s, we see a big sharp turn. And even bigger when we get to 1800s, the Industrial Revolution and more in the 1900s when we start using fertilizers, things like that, the population goes like that. It just, it's like a hockey stick. It's called a hockey stick graph because it does almost nothing forever and then something changes and all of a sudden whoosh, it gets really, really, really productive. All right, so this is what starts that hockey stick is the enclosure movement. Obviously we figure out technology and fertilizers and things that really improves it later on. Uh, but uh, this was the start of population growth and wealth too because this, this graph for population is also the same for how much money was made uh, per person uh, since year zero. It's the exact same graph, essentially, uh, and it's related at the beginning uh, here with this in the enclosure movement. Okay, that doesn't help everybody out, though. I just kicked off half the people. What the hell are they gonna do? Urbanization, nice. Okay, so what's that mean? It's uh, when you go and you just urbanize yourself and you go to the city. Okay, yeah, so this is rural, right, in the country. Yeah. Uh, urban is more so meaning like a, a metropolitan area, like a city. Okay, cool. So some of these guys, yeah, that sucks for them. They get kicked off their land. They don't know what else to do. So they have to like go somewhere else. All they can really do is hope they get hired somewhere else, maybe eventually. Uh, this is a slow process though. So as soon as you get kicked off, it's not like there's a job available next week. Uh, it could be years before another job's available. So they have to go to the city. And there is a temporary problem because all of a sudden cities, which only have a few people that live their whole lives, now all of a sudden there's a bunch of people that they've never seen before. There's too many of them. They don't have things like police. They don't have fire departments. They don't have codes. So people build their houses too close together so there's a fire, the whole neighborhood just goes up in flames. Uh, they don't have uh, jobs initially, so a lot of times they have to resort to crime. So there's a lot of problems here. But 
across the uh, decades, it actually becomes uh, a good thing. And here's why. Uh, this urbanization process, first of all, uh, when we start having factories later in the Industrial Revolution, which is more a history topic, these people become those workers and find jobs and help people out. Uh, but peasants actually find a way to make money on their own, even without uh, uh, living off the land like they used to. So whether they uh, are here being uh, workers during the day for the farming, or they've gone to the cities and they're looking for work, they find a way to make money. Uh, and this is what we call proto-industrialization. You're like, oh, that word sucks, and it does suck. This basically just means manufacturing things. So like this is manufactured, for example, the shirt. Like somebody didn't, I didn't make this, believe it or not. It was made in a factory, right? Somebody else manufactured it. Mm -hmm. uh, before we had factories, though, uh, people had to make it by hand. So what these peasants found was, well, since people have more food and more money because of the enclosure movement, uh, they're, they have more money to spend on other things. Because if I have enough food, what's the next thing I'm probably going to want to buy? Clothes, right. Like if you go down your list of necessities, you have like food, shelter, water, and then probably right next down the list is clothes. All right, so now that everybody's got enough food, hopefully water as well, um, or, or shelter, their focus is going to be on clothes. So if I'm a peasant and I'm sitting idly at night because I can't farm or I'm in the city looking for work, what could I do maybe on my own time at home to make money? Make you could make clothes. That's exactly what they start doing. They start taking wool, later cotton, and things like that, and they start making uh, clothes at home. And again, this is starting in roughly the 1500s and 1600s as this process is occurring. All right. Does that make the world better or worse? Better. Why? Because people learn how to make thicker clothes and all that. Okay, they make better clothes, but because everyone's making clothes, are there more clothes available or less? More. There's more available, right. So that makes clothes more expensive or cheaper? Cheaper. cheaper. So not only are people are earning more money, but stuff is actually cheaper. So does that mean I can buy more things? That is, right. So instead of worrying about, over time anyway, dying every day of starvation, or at least every year, I'm less concerned about that because there's a lot of food available, it's cheaper, uh, and I'm also probably warmer. So now I can start going further down the list of things. Once you get your clothes, it's a lot more open to things you like. Like you can decorate your house, uh, pay for things that you enjoy, pay for tastier foods or better foods, things like that. Once you get past the bare minimum of like, I need these things to survive, then you can start enjoying the things uh, you do uh, and working for money to buy things that you do enjoy, all right? Leisure time, which is like you doing things you want, like going to the movies, watching videos, things like that, that almost didn't exist prior to this movement because what were you doing all day? Working. Working, working or worried about not dying in some way, all right? Yeah, you'd have your time at when the sun went down to hang out with your family and you had meals and all that, obviously, but for the most part, you were working the whole time not to like buy cool things, but to not die or to try to not die. All right, this is when that system starts changing though. When they start closing off land, getting cheaper food, uh, people have more money, they go to the city, they start making clothes at home and selling those for profit, then they have more money, they can buy more stuff. It starts this cycle that uh, gradually starts making everyone's lives better because they uh, don't have to worry as much about starving, about going cold, uh, and things like that. Obviously, like I said, there's a lot of problems too. Like I said, the cities at first couldn't handle all the people. We had crime and fires and all this terrible stuff, but it was a process that gradually made our lives better. That's what the hockey stick was. The hockey stick didn't just all of a sudden in 1600 go become an L. It's a gradual uh, uh, momentum shift. But as you can see, the momentum picks up very rapidly, uh, especially as we get more money, which means people can do more things they want, which means they figure out cooler things like electricity and petroleum and machinery and factories, and that's why we have the life we have today, right? None of us in the developed world, for the most part, wake up every day worry about dying. Uh, that's not on most of our, if you have a terminal illness or you're unlucky, uh, if there's accidents, I, I get that, but it's not high on your list of worries, generally speaking. Whereas before, it was, that was just reality. So this started the process of human beings finding a way uh, to make their life gradually better uh, and suffer slightly less, right? Because obviously you're suffering if you're starving or worried about starving or cold or, or whatever. Uh, and this starts the process of taking those things that have plagued humans forever and still do in some parts of the world and, and starts making them better, all right? So any questions about that?
Cool, I think that was the two slides. Just jog my memory on a couple things so you guys can get some morning books and then get slides and then we'll, I'll show you how to play basketball. If there's time. Crap, I forgot to reward a couple of you. I know a couple of you answered. I think you answered something. Somebody else answered something too. You did. What? No? You, yeah, you can do some right. Cool. <clears throat> All right, so my question then is, I don't have an eraser. Uh, where did this whole uh, enclosure movement thing start? What was the first country that really started to protect private property and, and make it actually happen? England, yep. All right, uh, so what is the enclosure movement then? Like fencing off land. Why? Yeah, and profit yourself, exactly. Cool. Um, what happened as people began enclosing the land? What happened to those owners and people that, that, that worked it? Um, they got more money and the product became cheaper. Yes, they got more money, the product became cheaper, and they bought more land too and kept expanding. Okay, cool, cool. Um, what about those peasants that were kicked off of that enclosed land? Sucks for them, what, what's happening to them? What are they doing? They went to the city to find other jobs. Okay, cool. And uh, that didn't always work out, but yes, they do. And what do peasants that are both working uh, for these enclosed landowners and in cities, what do they start doing to make money for themselves, to buy more things they might need or want? Uh, create enclosed. Yeah, exactly. Do you remember what that was called, by the way? Uh, Big long word. I'll still give you the one for it. Proto-industrialization. Proto-industrialization, that is correct. Cool.